Well, hello, everybody, and welcome to this uh, masterclass on understanding of heat pumps delivered by uh, the Heat Pump Federation on behalf of the Social Housing Retrofit Accelerator Program. Uh, my name is Bean Beanland, and I will be giving you a short guide uh, through heat pump technology uh, uh, based on the agenda, which is on the screen now. So why decarbonize? Why is electrification carbon efficient? A little bit on heat pumps 101, visuals, facts, myths, uh, deployment uh, with tenant and householder considerations, a uh, small uh, element on pitfalls and contracting, uh, again, a small element on the inter potential integration with local generation, particularly solar PV generation, uh, some flexibility comments, uh, uh, a short description on DNO connections, uh, and a quick wrap up. So hopefully you will um, you will find the information to be of of use. So straight away, why is why are we having these conversations at all? So this video only runs for a few seconds. Uh, it's a record of temperature anomalies across the planet for the last hundred and uh, hundred and fifteen years or so. Um, and what you're looking for is the length of the spokes of the wheel and the deeper the colour in terms of red. Uh, the, U the United Kingdom is at about five to nine on the wheel, uh, with Europe between six o'clock and nine o'clock. So, as I say, it only runs for a few seconds, but I think it's a really good visual that uh, sets us on the pathway to say, you know, why are we having these conversations? So hopefully this uh, video will run for you. As you can see, <clears throat> for the first uh, start of the um, 20th century, uh, not that serious. Europe getting a little bit of acceleration, but nothing too serious. But the difference really starts to kick in from around about the 80s. Uh, and you can see that the average color starts to lose its blue tint and um, gain a very significant red tint. Uh, and if you compare the final shot, which we're about to get there, with how we started, you can see that the um, impact has been enormous. Uh, and for those commentators who say, well, it's entirely natural, uh, it's not man-made and therefore we shouldn't be doing anything about it. I think the point they're missing here is that the last time, um, yes, the planet has been through these cycles, but the last time we had this sort of temperature uh, shift in this sort of time frame, the humanoid um, uh, occupation of the planet was around 300,000. So moving 300,000 people around the planet from uh, areas that have become uninhabitable to those that were habitable, relatively easy. The population is now 8 billion. Uh, and so the impact on humanity is orders of magnitude greater. Uh, so we really do need to be thinking about doing something serious about this. So that's why we're doing, that's why we're having this conversation at all. Why is electrification carbon efficient? <clears throat> so this um, is a screen grab from a little app that sits on our website. Uh, we call it Carbon Watch. What it does is it takes real life data, uh, real time data uh, from the grid, uh, and then presents the carbon emissions, relative carbon emissions from different technologies at that given point in time. Um, I actually took this screen grab back in September last year. And the reason why I use it is that the, uh, the carbon factor for the national grid at the time which is in the top right hand dark gray box of 230 is very, very close to the figure that's currently in building regulations, which is 233. Uh, and that's represented by the thin vertical black line. So this is a pretty good shot of where government thinks that, you know, the average position was uh, and is currently, as I say, this is the building regulation situation as of today. Um, uh, you can see that um, at that time, the bottom three bars are coal, oil, and then gas going from bottom uh, up to middle. And those three are fixed because they are chemical properties of the fuel. So those carbon factors don't move at all. And you can see that uh, a gas boiler at this point in time was operating at a carbon efficiency of slightly less than building regulations uh, carbon factor for the grid. Um, the, the, Next up, grey bar, electric heating. That is resistive heat. So electric bar fires, electric panels.
channel radiators, etc. Uh, and that 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 bar clearly moves up and down with the grid. So you can see that it's effectively sitting at uh, at 233 or 230 uh, because it's an efficiency of one to one. Uh, the top two uh, yellow bars are representative of heat pump performance based on efficiencies of uh, four to one at the top and 3.2 to one um, just below. Those are broadly representative of ground source and air source heat pump efficiencies in, in pretty good, well-performing uh, scenarios. So what this shows you is that um, even with the grid operating at building regulation numbers, the carbon emissions derived from heat pump technologies is significantly below those of gas, uh, you know, roughly a third in the case of uh, air source and a quarter in the case of ground source. So we are already doing a significant amount of the heavy lifting and decarbonizing uh, our built environment by moving to heat pumps. And this situation will just continue to improve as the grid decarbonizes. On a really good day with the sun shining and the wind blowing, the grid is already down to sort of high single figures, you know, 80 odd uh, we've had in the past. And at that point, uh, the emissions from heat pumps are down in you know, very low double figures, 10, 12 uh, grams of CO2. So hugely lower than we're getting from any of the fossil fuel solutions at the moment. So that's why electrification is carbon efficient. Heat pumps 101. For those of you that want to know how a heat pump works, I mean, heat pump, uh, firstly, I would say, of course, you've all got heat pumps. We've all got heat pumps. Uh, we've all relied on heat pumps to keep our milk fresh and our peas frozen for decades. Uh, most of us have probably got air conditioning in our cars. Uh, some might even uh, have a heat pump tumble dryer by now or a heat pump in a coffee machine, for example. So the point of that is that this technology, it's a simple piece of science, but it's ubiquitous. It's everywhere in our lives already. So there's nothing to be scared of. And we are just using, uh, proposing that we use heat pumps in a slightly different way to that that we've been used to in the UK, even though there are millions of heat pumps for heating deployed across Europe and the States and other parts of the world. So this effectively could be a representation of what's going on in your fridge, but it would be going from right to left rather than from left to right. So. You can see that we've got an energy res uh, resource of some sort. In this instance, it's shown as a borehole, but it could e equally be uh, outside air. Uh, inside the box, we have two heat exchangers, evaporator and condenser. We have the compressor, which is where we use the bulk of our electricity. Uh, and we have an expansion valve. Uh, and inside the circuit, the circuit is hermetically sealed in the factory uh, at domestic level for domestic scale devices. We have a charge of refrigerant um, and we are increasingly as an industry moving towards lower global warming potential refrigerant gases. So we're moving away from chemical refrigerants towards natural refrigerants. Um, and many of you will be aware that we've now got uh, propane driven devices, uh, CO2, uh, ammonia. Uh, ammonia tends to be used in large commercial uh, schemes only, um, but propane is increasingly the refrigerant of choice and it allows us to achieve higher temperatures uh, and it has ultra low global warming potential. There is a small issue about flammability, but of course, in an air source environment, the device is outside if you're using one of the blocks. So even that is uh, not a problem. Um, and effectively, what's happening is we're bringing in some thermal energy from our external resource, whether it's air, ground, water. And provided that's coming in at a temperature which is higher than the boiling point of the refrigerant, uh, and the refrigerant boiling point is something below minus 15 degrees, so even when it's very cold outside, and you know, clearly heat pumps are working very well in Scandinavia, uh, there is plenty of thermal energy in the air to be able to boil the refrigerant. So in the evaporator, we are boiling the refrigerant. And the top uh, left-hand corner, we've got uh, gas, refrigerant gas, and we put that into the compressor. So this is where the, the science takes place. So you'll remember from your schoolboy and schoolgirl science physics that you can't compress a solid and you can't compress a liquid, but you can compress a gas. When you compress a gas, it gets hot. And the evidence of that from your school days was when you had your bicycle pump and you put your finger over the end and you pumped away, it got very hot. 
no, that is gas compression. And we can control the temperature that we effectively get on the output side. Uh, and, uh, and so that is how we constantly keep the efficiency of the device as high as we possibly can, because we're only ever um, creating a temperature in the top right hand corner um, that is commensurate with whatever's happening outside. Um, this is the sort of key to weather compensator control. So when it's very cold outside, we'll generate a higher temperature than when you into the radiators. Uh, and when it's um, uh, when the air temperature outside improves, we can allow that temperature to reduce. So we're always keeping the efficiency and the amount of work being done in the compressor to the minimum required. In the condenser, the second heat exchanger, we're then transferring that thermal energy into the household systems, whether it's into the radiators, under floor heating, into a hot water cylinder. Um, uh, this is obviously cooling the refrigerant. And then at the bottom, we take the pressure off in the expansion valve and the refrigerant returns to a liquid state. And that's literally just a continuous cycle. Um, so that cycle is running whenever the compressor is running and the compressor will be running when there's low. So when the house is calling for energy, the compressor will run. <coughs> Pardon me. When the house, when there's no demand, the compressor won't run. So what do these uh, units look like? Uh, you'll all be pretty familiar, I think, with the devices on the uh, left-hand side. They look much like air conditioning units. It's what we call air conditioning units in the UK are effectively air-to-air -air heat pumps. Uh, again, it's just another heat pump. And we're selling 160 odd thousand of those a year in the UK. So, again, another reason not to be scared of this technology. Uh, the one at the back, the double fan unit, that's a single heat pump circuit still. It just has twin fans for a bigger bigger system uh, and it means that in spring and autumn when the load is low you can run a single fan and it's one of the energy saving methods. Uh, the unit in the middle uh, at the top is a under counter ground source heat device so that would sit in a, a hole uh, as a washing machine slot, a dishwasher slot in a kitchen or utility room. Um, on the right hand side is the red. This is uh, a new form factor and you'll see in a minute why this is uh, why this is a, of interest. This is a UK designed and built machine coming out of Northern Ireland. Uh, Red themselves are now owned by Octopus. Um, and the devices in the middle I've included, they're from a Swedish company called um, CTC. And you can see that they're significantly bigger. They're about the size of an upright fridge freezer. Uh, the unit on the left of those three is, as you can see, two heat pumps in a single cabinet. That is actually designed for sort of larger properties, and we can get up to uh, sort of 34 kilowatts in a single cabinet uh, uh, in that device. Um, the other two I've included because they do have a particular application in that you can see they've both got cylinders built in. So they're both space saving because the cylinders are built in on top of the heat pump. Um, but the unit in the middle, you can see it has twin coils, and the coil at the top is delivering hot water instantaneously. So it is effectively a direct replacement for a combi boiler. So there's no stored potable hot water at all. And therefore, there's no uh, Legionnaire's risk you know, in a device of that nature. It's quite expensive, but um, <coughs> as I say, it does have its place. So what do they look like? What are the visuals? So on the, the left-hand side there, you know, if you're off, off grid, you're going to have an oil tank or a, uh, an LBG um, cylinder sitting outside your outside your house. You know, not the prettiest of things, um, but our industry is now busy improving the visuals for uh, for air source heat pumps. You know, ground source clearly doesn't matter because it's all inside. But here you can see a range of air source devices that are color coded to their background. The one in the bottom right hand side there is. Uh, skinned with a vinyl to make it look like the to match the the stone walling that it sits in front of, and there you can see the the red uh, in the top right, which is painted in green livery, uh, and in a rural garden looks just like a composter. So you know what not to like. Uh, so industry doing a lot to improve the visuals. Here we're into the sort of myth busting uh, uh, piece here now. So look, any emitter type, you may well have heard. Uh, commentators say, oh, it must be central, it must be underfloor heating, it must be massive radiators. Not a bit of it. Um, underfloor heating is great. 
because it is designed for a lower flow temperature. So <clears throat> that's certainly an advantage, but it's not a necessity. So we can work with underfloor heating, we can work with trench heaters, we can work with standard uh, panel radiators, you know, K1, K2, K3s. We can work with uh, cast iron um, sectional radiators, even uh, uh, original sort of Victorian cast iron radiators, fine. Uh, and the device in the middle there is a fan coil. The key is the sizing of all these devices. So if we make sure that they're sized for the flow temperatures that are needed to get the thermal energy into any given room, then, um, then we're correctly sized. There's no question about oversizing, it's correct sizing. Same applies to fossil fuels, of course. You need to have correctly sized um, emitters for fossil fuels. <coughs> <clears throat> and what we should all remember is that a, a condensing boiler is inherently a low flow temperature device. It should be operating with a return temperature of no more than 56 degrees in order to be in condensing mode. And the only way to guarantee that is to put the, the water out at 55 degrees because we don't know what the building is going to be calling for. Uh, and 55 degrees, of course, is now in building regulations as the maximum design flow temperature for all new build and for all complete system replacements. It doesn't yet apply to just straight boiler replacement, but clearly that's the direction of travel. And 55 degrees is actually not a bad starting point for, for a heat pump that's fully weather compensated. If we have to put out 55 degrees from a heat pump when it's minus three, minus four outside, uh, we are very quickly uh, reducing that flow temperature as the air temperature improves. So it's not a um, it's not a killer for performance by any means if the system is fully weather compensated. So there's a heat pump for every dwelling. Again, another myth. You know, you can't make heat pumps work in certain types of dwellings. You can't make them work in what we call you know hard to hard to treat buildings. Um, this is the uh, demographic of the heat pump demonstrator program run by the EPS catapult, the new systems catapult on behalf of government over the last two and a half years. You can see that there's a whole range of property ages and, uh, and property types, you know, flats, mid terrace, end of terrace, semi-detached, detached, and from pre-1919 you know, pre right up to relatively modern builds. So <clears throat> what they found is that there wasn't a house that they couldn't put a heat pump in. So there wasn't a dwelling that they couldn't identify some form of heat pump solution for. Uh, and that's really important to recognize because uh, we are frequently told, though, hard to treat. From our perspective, the hard to treat unit is actually a flat in a block of privately owned leasehold apartments because getting all of the owners to move at once to do a sort of centralized solution of some sort is incredibly difficult. Uh, if you gave me a listed building, 200 years old, leaky like a sieve, I would be happy to put a heat pump in it tomorrow. Uh, and I know it can be done. We've been doing that. Our industry has been doing that. Practitioners who know how to work with buildings have been doing those, those sorts of installs for decades. So there's no building type barrier. <clears throat> so what are the considerations? Can a heat pump provide enough heat? Uh, or are supplementary systems required? Again, another myth. You have to have some sort of backup system. Not a bit of it. If everything is designed properly, so that is starting with the uh, the lost art of heat loss calculations and proper design. Um, as long as we understand the building, then we can build a heating solution. Uh, and I would suggest to you that actually we should understand the building, even if we're staying with fossil fuels, um, because uh, getting fossil fuel systems to operate in condensing mode at maximum efficiency also requires heat loss calculations, proper design, proper understanding of flow temperatures, um, because the building doesn't know where the heat's coming from. The building has no idea whether there's a boiler or whether there's a heat pump or whether it's a biomass system. The building will leak heat at the rate at which the building leaks heat. So it's important for all technologies that we improve uh, insulation levels where it's appropriate to do so. But it is absolutely not the case that you need more insulation for a heat pump system in order to deliver comfort 
uh, than you do for any other type of, of boiler, combustion boiler. Um, there is no need at all to compromise comfort levels when transitioning away from combustion uh, towards an electrified future. Um, you may have heard talk about uh, hybrid systems. Um, so in a hybrid system, you have uh, part fossil fuels um, and the part heat pump. Um, <clears throat> Uh, hybrids are potentially a good uh, uh, stepping stone on the transition, and they can help people with reassurance as they don't feel that they're totally exposed. Uh, and it's important to make sure that people do feel comfortable in the transition, not only physically comfortable, but that they feel that um, they're not being exposed to uh, a risk. But you do need a plan B with the hybrids in that if you have sized the heat pump for less than 100% of the load, on the basis that the boiler is making up the difference in the winter. That's fine, but the boiler is likely to last less long than the heat pump element, particularly if you bolt it onto an existing boiler, of course. Uh, and so you need to make sure that you understand what you're going to do when the boiler dies, because you potentially run the risk of being left with an undersized heat pump. So my starting point in a hybrid solution would be even if we're using hybrids, let's try and size the heat pump for 100% of the load so that we do have that plan B for when the boiler uh, falls over or when the fossil fuel element is withdrawn by regulation, of course, which will eventually come. Uh, and that will happen sooner for oil and LPG than natural gas. Um, what are the benefits? Though we have improved comfort. Most people who have got heat pump systems report an improvement in their comfort level. Temperature distribution is much, much more even. It's much more steady. You don't see the building uh, fluctuating through highs and lows in temperature and humidity, incidentally. And so there is an improvement to comfort level. Difficult to quantify, but it's very definitely there. We have an improvement in, in controls. Um, and I think this is really important in, in social and sort of sheltering housing, vulnerable housing environments where it's possible for uh, a social landlord to monitor heat pump performance remotely, um, suitable protections around data, of course, in, in place. But it, it can it can then be designed to the system designed to flag up anything that the consumer may have done, the homeowner, the tenant may have done, to um, throw that control system out of its um, normal operational range, uh, which might be causing higher operational costs, for example. Um, someone may have tweaked a uh, heat curve on the controls, which has made the system less efficient. So uh, it is really useful for uh, landlords to be able to monitor such things. And the remote access does provide really good troubleshooting, initial troubleshooting, without having to send engineers out to the property. Uh, we have obviously carbon emissions, this is why we're doing this in the first place, but we also have air quality improvement, and that's both internal and external. Uh, when one's burning fossil fuels for heat inside the building, you are producing NOx, SOx and particulates in the building, um, which is a contributory factor for poor air quality, and particularly for those that suffer from chest illness or asthma, for example. Um, heat pumps are inherently zero generators of uh, emissions, uh, not only carbon, but NOx, SOx and particulates at the point of use. Um, we also published some procurement advice. So really important to understand how you go about selecting uh, installers, selecting contractors. Uh, this device, this advice, which is published on our website, you can see the link there. Um, this doesn't tell you how to install a heat pump, but what it does do is it equips you to be able to identify whether the contractors that you are considering uh, and are talking to you actually know what they're doing and are capable of making sure that they look after you and should you appoint them. So in terms of scope and consents, you know, device locations, uh, indoor, outdoor units, um, we do need cylinders by and large. Um, the device I showed earlier, which does instantaneous hot water, is pretty expensive at the moment. And it's probably not the solution for most uh, social housing environments. So we do need to find room for a cylinder because we are going to be displacing combi boilers in a, a lot of situations. Um, if we're space constrained, we're always space constrained, let's face it, 
there is the potential to use phase change materials. So in a phase change uh, device, we can store the same amount of energy in a volume which is about a quarter of that that you would uh, have with a traditional cylinder. Uh, and because they are boxes rather than cylinders that require some form of stratification and therefore height, they can be a, a phase change device can be slotted in under a staircase or into a cupboard in a way that a cylinder probably can't be positioned. Uh, I put a link there to Sunamp, who are one of the major practitioners of phase change material storage here in the UK. Uh, we have to consider permitted development rights. Uh, these are currently dating from 2015 and are, have definitely not kept up with the improvements to um, heat pump technologies. Um, government is currently analysing uh, PDR and we're expecting some changes probably in the next 12 months. But at the moment, um, most domestic installations do enjoy professional, uh, yeah, nah, professional do enjoy permitted development rights. Uh, there is a noise assessment. Uh, which is run under MCS 020 um, to ensure that one enjoys uh, PDR. Um, but again, even that is currently under review because many of the devices now on the market are whisper quiet. Uh, conservation areas, listed buildings, clearly you may require some additional consents um, <clears throat> and, and grid connections. And we'll talk about grid connections a little bit more further down the track. But uh, most domestic heat pumps now enjoy what we call connect notify status, which means that you can connect them and then just tell the DNO, the distribution network operator, that you have installed uh, a device. Uh, and the same applies to the electric vehicle charge points. There are significant differences, of course, between air source and ground source in these respects. Uh, fundamentally, ground source doesn't need consents of any sort because if everything is inside the curtilage of the building, there's nothing to be seen, there's no visual impact. Uh, and so um, uh, uh, the uh, risks to prevent development are that much smaller. Um, air source one is a think about where does the outside unit go? Is it visible to the road, for example? So there are some uh, aspects there that need to be thought through. Uh, and then we have potential for overnight operation uh, to deliver flexibility. And in our world, flexibility, a bit like charging an electric vehicle overnight on low cost or lower cost and lower carbon electricity, we can potentially avoid peak times with heat pump operation um, with a degree of uh, thermal storage in, some, in, in place. What are the key factors for your tenants and for homeowners? So look, they will say, well, fossil fuels just work. Well, do they? Um, does your condensing, the existing condensing boiler, actually operate in condensing mode? Are the emitters, the radiators, sized for that boiler to be operating at low temperature? Or has it just been deployed and commissioned based on its manufacturer's um, preset, which may well be 80 degrees flow or even 70 degrees flow? Uh, in which case it spends very little time in condensing mode and may be inherently very inefficient. And the difference between a boiler that's operating in condensing mode to its maximum of capability and that which is doing nothing uh, of that sort um, could be 12 to 15 percent. So it's significant in terms of gas usage. There's a natural resistance and a fear of change. Of course there is. Uh, <clears throat> and good installing contractors will be able to help you with the messaging that you're able to give to tenants and homeowners. Um, we tend, we have tended to have a very low valuation of energy. I entirely accept that there are those with, um, with in, living in fuel poverty, but most people in the UK have historically valued energy very low, very lowly because we've had access to cheap North Sea oil and gas. And this has created a resistance to insulation. You know, why insulate when the fuel is so cheap? Uh, for tragic reasons, of course, that attitude has shifted a lot in the last 12 months. Um, <clears throat> and we are now much more aware of the value of insulation and the value of not wasting heat. Uh, to give you a feel for the scale of the problem, there is anecdotally enough waste heat across Europe, including the UK in, in this instance, geographically. There's enough waste heat in Europe to heat Europe. That's how bad we are, uh, and, and the UK is particularly bad 
because of the state of our, our housing stock. Um, we have the capital cost of change. We have the operational cost. Electric clearly is expensive uh, compared to gas. You know, it's roughly three times the price of gas. So your heat pump has to be operating at you know, three to one, 2.8 to one, just to stand still in terms of operational costs. Uh, and what we actually really need to do is get to a point where electricity is priced fairly uh, against what it actually costs to generate, uh, in which case um, we would see a much greater demand for a transition to an electrified solution because it would make economic sense to do so. And we have this general knowledge and, and lack of understanding, lack of knowledge, lack of understanding, yeah. uh, which this sort of masterclass is designed to improve, of course, and we're doing these sorts of things for community groups all the time. Um, what other factors we've got in play? Well, we've got environmental attitudes on the positive side. You know, Sir David Attenborough was the biggest rock star at Glastonbury not that many years ago. Um, Greta, uh, clearly a bit of a Marmite character, but you know she has definitely increased that intergenerational pressure. Um, we have building regulations coming through. We have minimum energy efficiency standards, uh, increasing um, robustness of building regulations. And there'll be another update in 2025 to coincide with the um, future home standard, and um, we have off-gas consultations on potential bans on replacement of fossil fuel boilers off the gas grid. We have government funding contributions, and of course, you know, you are, uh, you, your clients will be in receipt, in, in receipt of some of some of these, hopefully. Uh, and we have this better offer. We've got better controllability. I've talked about the ability to troubleshoot remotely, um, uh, and. We have this uh, transitional approach, should we need it, to reassure uh, homeowners and tenants. So what are the pitfalls that we need to keep a, keep a look out for? It's never the technology. It's rarely the technology. Yeah, I'm sure you know, the devices will break down occasionally. Um, but they are actually robust and there are very few moving parts. So uh, it's, a, it's a robust technology. Um, the problems almost always come from poor specification, which is poor understanding of the building and of the technology, coupled probably with poor installation. So you know, because we're, we're doing this relatively newly in the UK, levels of experience are not yet as robust as they need to be. Uh, and, and so we do have to take a bit more care in selecting the uh, installers that we um, all choose to get into bed with uh, in order to make sure that they've got the experience with the solutions. So again, referring back to our document, our guide, the procurement guidance document, uh, there's a lot of things in that which you would say are common sense, but we all need to be uh, reminded of the basics from time to time. Uh, and there's a, a number of additional tips in there just to try and make sure that uh, if you are uh, looking to appoint contractors that you've got people who you really should be um, should be making use of. Uh, we do have times when consumers will uh, interfere with controls in a way that's unhelpful uh, and can inadvertently cause a problem. And again, that's the, one of the values of the remote access. Uh, we have uh, consumers ending up on inappropriate tariffs for whatever reason. Um, we should be developing bespoke consumer guidance. So one of the requirements of the MCS standard microgeneration certification standard is that the, the installer provides really good guidance to the consumer on how to use the system. Uh, and of course, those have to be bespoke because the systems are by and large bespoke. Um, maintenance regimes need to be thought about. Uh, again, no more demanding than with existing fossil fuels, but it is something that has to be thought about because the number of contractors available to provide maintenance is clearly lower at the moment because the market is not so big, but I'd like to think that your installer would provide you with a maintenance regime uh, to go with your purchase. Um, we, we are going to have increasingly complex technology interfaces uh, as we electrify everything, so heating, transport, uh, and some generation. You know, we are going to have uh, an increased complexity within the home. Um, now, this isn't anything that anyone should be afraid of, because I am pretty confident that the market will again start to provide 
third party solutions that will look after all these various um, technologies in the home and will optimize the performance of them, of them all. Uh, so the home owner doesn't have to worry about it. You merely have to say when you need to have the services, what temperature you require, when you need your car, etc. And <clears throat> the software will do the rest. Um, uh, and that's particularly important when we come to integrating with local generation, with solar PV, move on the roof, some battery storage, uh, and of course your EV charging. So choosing contractors, it's really important, I think, that you choose the contractor, not the hardware. So start with the people, and then through them and discussion with them, choose the hardware. And of course, you really want them to be using hardware that they know well, that they have experience with, and ideally that they've been factory trained in, particularly the commission engineers. You know, I like to see commission engineers that have been sent to Germany or Scandinavia or where it is to a uh, manufacturer's training center for, for training in commissioning particularly. Uh, we need to see warranty registration in the scope of your contracts. Really important. So many manufacturers report to us that they don't get final warranty registration because they will sell the device to a distributor, the distributor will sell it to the contractor, the contractor will put it in place. You can see there's a number of points of failure there where the warranty may not get registered. And very important that the warranties are registered. Uh, maintenance contracts we've already talked about, uh, either in scope for the original uh, deployment or potentially uh, for you to consider training in-house uh, capability for maintenance. Um, <clears throat> Uh, Heat Trust provides consumer protection for those on networks, uh, and that could be uh, micro networks with um, what we would call an ambient loop uh, in the ground with a number of distributed ground source heat pumps uh, on them. Uh, could be heat as a service, it could be heat the streets. And again, this is uh, an extension of the concept of an ambient loop where the heat collector or holes probably uh, would be drilled or are being drilled now in the streets and each property has a connection to that borehole array. So you don't have your own borehole, but you are connected to a network. Um, so again, it's an extension of the network concept. Uh, in contracting terms, again, we would be looking for MCS certification uh, and, uh, and for a full MCS design process. Um, MCS has been through the wars a bit. It's had its moments when it wasn't actually particularly functional. Um, but the changes to the both the setup since the scheme was migrated from government ownership into the current charity format uh, have been significant. There are real changes in consumer protection coming through. So I would strongly uh, encourage you to consider MCS certification, even if you're not requiring it for um, government support programs, for example, because I think that in due course, the level of consumer protection provided will be very, very considerable. Uh, and potentially, you, know, you need to look for turnkey solutions at this stage. You know, this is relatively early days in the electrification piece, uh, much easier for consumers, uh, housing associations, social housing providers, and private individuals if they've got all of these things sort of in one place. Uh, so the technology integration, controls, remote access, automatic fault warning, those things, they're all in one place, that much easier to manage. Uh, on solar photovoltaic introduction, uh, integration, so solar PV, uh, as you can see, perfectly good for new build and for retrofit, um, and so equally applicable. The current generation modules are so much more efficient than those in the past. You, know, you can now get sort of 435 watts per module uh, out of a, a panel that's the same size that, that previously would have been delivering sort of 250 watts uh, not that long ago. So there have been some real improvements. Uh, and, and technically, there have also been improvements for efficiency with respect to orientation, shading, inclination. So generally speaking, an all round better, better product. Um, combined with battery export, you can reduce uh, battery storage, you can reduce export. Uh, very important to try and make sure that the value is maximized if all the generation is used on site. Selling back into the grid doesn't really produce particularly good value for money. 
So there's a balance. You know, you're going to probably overgenerate in the summer a bit, and you're going to have to import in the winter. Um, but it's a, a question about looking for that sweet spot of investment. Potential for local microgrids, you know, where neighbours and neighbourhoods are selling electricity within uh, within a microgrid amongst themselves. Um, that will definitely uh, be coming and becoming much more um, prevalent in the UK market. Uh, and then I made a note here about onshore wind. Uh, onshore wind, I think, is going to have a huge role to play, particularly in providing that uh, that that um, co-located introduction of generation capability, uh, where we're running heat pump systems. And of course, the beauty of onshore wind is it's not seasonal, or at least it's much less seasonal than uh, solar PV. Uh, and I think that resistance to onshore wind is is falling away particularly when you make sure that there's some significant benefit for the communities. You know, if you get uh, lower cost electricity, if you're in proximity to a wind turbine, for example, or when the wind speed hits a certain level, the electricity price drops. If consumers can see these benefits, then um, degrees of resistance to, to change it costs are that much lower. Uh, <clears throat> And now, uh, flexibility value, I've mentioned flexibility before, and just to confirm, flexibility in our world is about flexing the time of day at which we are using grid electricity. Um, you appreciate that um, there are peaks in demand already in terms of grid electricity, so points where uh, electricity becomes higher cost and therefore um, tends to be higher carbon. The usual peak um, is between sort of four o'clock in the afternoon and eight o'clock in the evening. Uh, and we have another smaller one in the morning and a smaller one even still at lunchtime. Uh, and it's a question about trying to see if we can move our, our demands around to avoid those peak times. And with a bit of thermal storage, one can avoid running heat pumps at times of peak, uh, uh, peak electricity costs and peak carbon emissions. Um, the alternative is the more traditional approach, where if you have a constraint on the grid, uh, that is dealt with by calling in what we call peaking plant. Uh, and in fact, that image, um, the bottom image on the left-hand side, that is um, gas peaking plant, as you can see effectively, it's a row of containers with big gas boilers in them. Uh, and they are called in uh, at very short notice to provide additional firepower to the grid. Uh, on the right-hand side at the bottom, there's a big battery system that's an alternative way of providing more power, but actually you could get a much better result for UK PLC by instead of putting more power into the grid, turning some load off, because that way we don't have to invest in the generation in the plant, we don't have to invest in the cables in the ground to carry the peak. Um, we can control things by what we call demand side management, demand side um, uh, response, so that uh, if there is a constraint, we can shut things down. And we're already seeing massive value being delivered, uh, particularly in horticulture and agriculture, where we're doing large heat pump systems that can be switched off at a moment's notice in order to deal with instantaneous um, grid constraints. Uh, and Imperial College uh, and the Carbon Trust, I think it was, put a value on this in a report from two or three years ago. And that, uh, even then, they were looking at something in the region of 16 to 17 billion pounds per annum in value, which would be shared across the board, including with the consumers. Of course. So consumer benefit has to be construed from, from this. Uh, so <clears throat> finally, working with network operators, distribution network operators, really important that uh, the deployment of all of these um, new loads, heat pumps, EV charging, is done uh, in tandem with the network operator. It's very important that they know what it is that's being deployed. As I say, most heat pumps are now what we call connect and notify domestic heat pumps. So you can put them in and then just tell the network that, uh, what you've done. But it is critical that um, that, that step is, is taken. Occasionally, uh, for bigger properties, the heat pumps might, might be sufficiently large that they require prior consent but we are increasingly moving to a situation where for 95% of domestic properties, um, no need for prior consent. The device can be installed, commissioned, and then just reported after the event. 
Uh, so just to confirm those things, um, we, we have some forms available from the Energy Networks Association website on uh, uh, telling uh, the DNOs that you can complete to tell the DNOs what's been done. Uh, it is possible to back submit those applications. So anybody who's doing a significant number of properties at a single location can uh, batch apply. Um, so we're trying to make that part of the process as simple and as straightforward uh, as possible. Um, clearly, removing barriers to heat pump deployment is a key factor in our world. So there we go. Um, that is a very short tour around the world of uh, heat pumps. I hope that that's given you answers to some of the questions that you may have had at the outset. Um, if you if you have supplementary questions, you are very welcome to contact me or contact the Federation through our website. And uh, you can see that there are also a couple of additional points of contact on the screen. So thank you very much indeed for, uh, for watching this masterclass. Uh, I hope that it's been of significant benefit to you. Bye.